Hello and welcome to the Facing Up podcast with me, Luke Grenfell Shaw. Have you ever felt trapped inside your job? Have you ever been stuck in a career that no longer quite fits for you? Have you ever been not quite sure how to move forward? If you ever thought this, then I think this is an episode you might really want to listen to because this week I am talking with Philip Taylor. Um, who also happens to be my godfather, but spent a lot of time in um, working for the IBM um, as a, getting up to a senior executive, a, a job that seemed to have a, a huge number of, of perks, you know, a great salary, company car, I'm sure unlimited coffee in, in the office. Um, however, this was a job that um, Philip no longer enjoyed and um, eventually he left for an entirely different profession. And so this week, uh, I'm really excited to be talking to Philip about his transition from a job that society would say has it all to something that he now does, which from everything he's told me gives him a lot greater sense of satisfaction. It's not been a change without its risks and challenges, and that's what I'm really excited to be talking to Philip today about. Philip, welcome to the Facing Up podcast. Thank you, Luke. Thank you for inviting me. So, um, to begin with, why did you want to leave your job at IBM? I think that's... Uh question could probably keep us going for the entire podcast actually it's um that there's no one single answer um and if i look back i mean firstly i joined ibm while i was at university um i wrote to 40 companies asking for summer holiday work and one of those companies wrote back and i stayed there for the next 32 years um so it's funny how you fall into things sometimes by accident. And I think that that's what happened to me. I don't think I had great career advice at school. I don't think I had great thought processes in this is what I really want to go and do. I was good at maths. So I did maths and I did computing at university. I enjoyed that. And I fell into a computing related job. Mm. And IBM being a very, very big um multidisciplined organization was somewhere that I could go and do lots of different things over over three decades. Um, I remember a time probably 15 years ago where I was not particularly happy with what I was doing and at the time I had two young children I had a large mortgage um, the children at the time were at a private prep school um, and the risk of if you like throwing that away and not knowing what I wanted to do was probably what well, was much, much higher. Mm. And I had a long chat with a, a good friend, actually the, the man who was my best man um, about where I was and what I wanted to do. And he said, well, you've got two choices. He said, you can throw this in and go and find out what you want to do, mm. or you stay with the job with all of its um, unhappinesses and mm. the good money and the flexibility and alongside that you do other things that make you happy so mm. playing with an orchestra being a school governor working with a charity that brought kids over affected by chernobyl to this country all of those things which mm. i was doing alongside work and i had a long think about that and thought well actually at this point in my life keeping the stability of you know, yeah. as I say, a nice salary. You said nice company. Oh, the one thing that you don't ever get at IBM is free coffee. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm never going. Uh, They're lost to me. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, so at that point, that was the right decision. But mm. then coming forward another, another 15 years to mm. 2018, and probably a couple of years before that, mm. um, I felt that the company had moved much more from when I joined in the mid eighties, mm -hmm. when it was a family oriented, friendly, caring, supportive company um, to now where I think like probably the majority of corporations, the only thing that matters is the bottom line. Right. And one of the eff side effects of that is that obviously if you're working to the bottom line, you focus intently on cost. 
Mm. And where I believe the company has got to in, in a, a large part is that people are pure cost. Right. And so workers are a drain on the budget. They're as, as dispensable as not buying another computer was, you know, or not buying another desk or not repainting the office, you know, you, right. Was, was, and I guess I want to be a little bit careful because I don't want this to come across as me slagging off IBM. I think IBM does a huge amount of good in the world and it's mm. done me a lot of good mm. in 32 years. Mm. But where I, I, the tipping point for me was when almost with the, the, the stroke of a pen, the company took 40% of the people out of the group I, w I sat in in the UK, took them out with involuntary redundancy at UK statutory minimum payment. Right. So, you know, five years ago, involuntary redundancy was a dirty word and it was all voluntary and it was incredibly generous. Yeah. Back down to now. So if, and, and of course that made me do the sums. Yeah. And if I had left at that point um, mm. under that involuntary scheme, if I'd been forced out, I would have left with about two months salary. Um, After working there for 30 years or so 30 yeah 32 years and, and how does that make it, you feel as a as a human being <laughs> it made me feel um i mean worthless might be a little bit too strong but it was almost there it was actually they don't care about me as a person they care about me as a philip costs us this much on the bottom line mm. and actually we could we could get rid of him because you know, what I've found out, and I've been through a lot of these programs at IBM, is that you, you get rid of people, but the work doesn't go away and it just gets shared out. And of course, there are efficiencies and you start looking at artificial intelligence and all that sort of stuff. But mm. the work never, never really goes away. Yeah. So it, it, and as I say, it was a tipping point for me. It was mm. a realization that I actually was at a point where I was doing a job at a high level with immense mm. pressure, mm. constant work, um, you know, never really switching off when you're on holiday or you're at the weekend or at the evening. Um, and I had to decide, do I put up with that? And with all the benefits, the fabulous salary, the, you know, the company car, the private medical health insurance, all of this stuff that you get as a, as the cotton wool that wraps around you. Yeah. Or do I think, you know what, it's time for me to go and do something else. Mm. And what that process did was it made me stop, do the sums, mm. um, work out what we could afford. Yeah. Um, and compared to 15 years ago, when I had that conversation yeah. about stay here and do things alongside, mm. I was now at a point where I could say, well, actually, you know what? I can take some of my pension now. Mm. I can afford to do a job that doesn't pay very much. And believe me, the ambulance service doesn't pay very much. Mm. Um, and, but I don't have a mortgage anymore. Mm. And my girls have left home and, you know, so things had shifted. I'm, I'm really interested that you said uh, you had this mental conversation and this conversation with your best man 15 years ago, whether you weren't that happy at IBM, but you made the decision you could do these other activities around the side now me in my you know crusader mode would go well you weren't happy at ibm i can't believe how that could ever be the right decision to stick with ibm and do these other things around the side because the idealist in me would say just follow your heart and find your ideal career i'm really interested that you said it was the right decision so i was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on that because it's more complex than I'm making it out to be of just follow your heart. And it's interesting you say that because one of the things I love doing is coaching people. And I've coached a good number of people at all sorts of levels when I was in IBM and, and some outside. Um, and I, I, th th there's a, a, a lady I coached who was a new graduate into IBM, coached her all the way through that process. And then as she worked her way through, she then wanted to go and leave and do an MBA. And she had to choose 
between going to uh, a, a Canadian university for two years or going to Cambridge for one year and could not make the decision. And we had, uh, you know, one of many coaching sessions over coffee in the National Theatre. Um, and I said exactly that to her. I said, you know, we sort of done the pros and the cons. And I said, where's your heart? Mm. And you know, it stopped her dead. And she, she looked at it and she thought about it and she said, well, it's, it's Canada. And right. I said, okay. Um, and then three weeks later, she told me she'd accepted the place at Cambridge. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness. That's not what you expected. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't. Um, but I think what I'd done was I'd enabled her to think about it in a slightly different way. And mm. I, I think she felt that a Cambridge MBA um, carried more weight than Right. you know an mba from a university that many people won't have heard heard of however mm. however good mm. um to come back to the question though i think that 15 or so years ago it was too frightening to look at if you like taking that jump from the established settled and, and you said in your introduction you know the sort of job that most people would think well this this you've got everything it's it's everything you everything you want it's a, a, a stable solid you know good mm. company to work for successful um and i think also there's something that comes with um I mean, I think it's taken me a lot longer to get to the point probably where you are now to your, your, your point about, well, you know, Philip, just, just leave, you know, just go and follow your heart, go and go and do <laughs> what's right. And, and I was looking at, you know, relatively new house, big mortgage, mm. two children. Um, and, and there are, there are elements to the equation, which I think would probably have been too frightening to, to, to leave at that point. It's, I'm really interested in using the word frightening here because um, that, that implies, I suppose, that you're scared about doing something rather than it necessarily being the right or the wrong decision. It just seems too much to go there. Do you think if you, I'm pushing you a bit here, you know, do you think mm. if you had taken that jump that overcome that fear, how do you think that would have actually worked out? Uh, I think, and, and hindsight is wonderful, isn't it? Um, right. <laughs> um, I think I'd be in a very different place now. And the place I think I would be, so I need to talk about a friend of mine called Pete. Um, so Pete, probably a bit longer ago than this, gave up a management consultancy job at one of the big four mm -hmm. um, in London. And I think he must have been in his uh, late 20s, early 30s. So he'd probably been there for eight, 10 years, something like that. Okay, still quite early on and in his career. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But he gave up all, you know, everything that I had at IBM, he mm -hmm. would have had at that firm. Mm -hmm. And he went and joined the Southeast Coast Ambulance Service. Mm -hmm. um, and I knew him because he played double bass in um, one of the orchestras I play in. As you do. Philip um, plays the bass the, clarinet and the clarinet, <laughs> we should say. Very well, indeed. Thank you, Luke. Um, so he joined and he joined, you know, at the, the lowest level, which is what I've now done. Mm. Um, gradually worked his way through, became a paramedic practitioner, which is the level above paramedic. It's the, mm. you know, the master's degree on top of the normal paramedic. Mm -hmm. So it became very, very skilled, very senior. Um, and then in more recent years, moved from the ambulance service to East Surrey Hospital in Red Hill. Um, and he was one of the team that ran the miners unit in A&E. Mm -hmm. And I, I think... Yeah, preempting maybe one of the questions about why did I move to what I'm doing? Mm. I think somewhere in the back of my mind has always been, well, Pete did that, did it a long right. time ago and look where he's got to. Mm. So I think if I had made that decision, I mean, firstly, I don't, I, I didn't know this wasn't a career that I really thought about 15 years ago. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a lot sort of dancing about, about yes. why did I do this and when did I do it and why didn't I do it 15 years ago? Mm. Um, but I think, you know, conceivably, I would have take, followed a similar path to, to the path that Pete led. Okay. Um, and, and the reason I mentioned him, again, preempting some of the conversation we'll have, is he's very much in my mind at the moment because he contracted COVID, spent a month in intensive care, intubated, and he lost oh, his right. life. 
Mm. And, you know, that's tough. You know, those yeah. are the things that you don't often come across in big corporates. Um, yeah. You know, it's a, it, it, we're much nearer the edge in many ways, I think. That brings about, illustrates the reality of, and the risks of what you do and, and what Pete did. And yeah. you know, you, there aren't any guarantees in any job that you do, but you certainly put yourself at different risks when you put yourself on the medical front line. Yes. Yes. So I, you, you know, to, to, I, I think it's interesting. I sort of feel in many ways that I've, I've bumbled my way through my working life. Hmm. I've, I've had some success. I've done well at it. I was, I know I was respected at, at IBM mm -hmm. um, for what I did and what I knew and how mm -hmm. I worked with people. Um, but with hindsight and mm -hmm. had I had, you know, some, some, some good career advice from right. people who were actually interested in me. Yeah. I think I probably would have gone into the medical field in some form mm -hmm. or another. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's interesting. And it's, as you say, hindsight is an easy thing to, to come across. Uh, and I, it does make me wonder to what extent, I mean, whenever I hear the word fear or, or afraid uh, or, or scared of doing something, I now, um, I think partly having watched some of like Brené Brown's uh, TED Talks, and it, to me, that's more of a reason to jump into doing something. And it's very easy for me to say, uh, particularly when I'm not having to do anything more than sit in my chair right now. But you know, do the things that make you afraid are usually mm, things to take on, in, in my experience. But that doesn't make them at all easy. And I think you're right. I don't. I don't think any of this is easy. Um, I think I was just, you know, again back to your point of why didn't I do this 15 years ago? I I I just don't think I was in the right space at that point. Yeah. And I think you know, entering my fifties, I was actually at a point where I thought, you know what, I can do this. Yeah. I, I can go and do something completely different. Yeah. Um, I want to flip the question round um, as hmm. well in that I'm saying, oh, Philip, 15 years ago, you could have just followed your heart. However, I'm quite interested to know what you think about someone in, um, you know, I, I'm relatively we're pretty unencumbered by responsibilities. I don't have a mortgage. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. It's so easy for me to say this. Um, I'm just wondering what your perspective on that might be. How different it is when you do have a mortgage and you do have these responsibilities. Am I almost being insensitive? I don't think you're being insensitive, but I think <clears throat> everybody has things around them um, which have to be considered. So when I was considering this 15 years ago, um, you know, I had to think about the mortgage, you know, because if I had left my job at that point and gone to something like I'm doing now, that would almost certainly would have necessitated, you know, downsizing the house. So that would have had an impact on my wife, my children, mm -hmm. our way of life, where we lived, um, and would have had huge, huge impact on other people. Mm. Now, that may or may not have been the right thing to do at the time. I decided at the time that it wasn't and stayed with it. Um, I, I think that, I don't, so I don't think you're being insensitive, but I think you're right that, you know, you, Luke, where you sit, have a different set of things around you. And by things, I mean, you know, responsibilities, experiences, commitments, whatever they might be. Yeah. Um, you've got a, a different set to the ones I have mm. um, and a, a different, uh, I guess, a, a different outlook as well um, mm. and a different, a, a different drive for what you want to achieve. Mm. And so there did come a point where you, the, the, you know, you're in a position where you no longer had a mortgage that you could, I guess, take th this risk. You talked about 
seeing the way that IBM treated its employees almost as numbers, as drains on, on the bank balance. Was there a tipping point? You're saying that was a bit of a tipping point. What was the thing that actually made you hand in your resignation? Or um, Well, so January 2018 was when this round of redundancy came. Mm. Um, and as I say, it wasn't the first one I'd been through. Um, mm. But it was it was the scale of it, taking 40% of the mm. people out of a group. Um, it was the, it was almost the brutality of it that, the, you know, it was, well, we can do this easily and cheaply in the UK because of the legislation on involuntary redundancy. So we're going to do it all there. We're not going to try and do it in France or Germany or the Netherlands where the works councils make it really hard Oh, I see. Um, so they're doing all so, their cuts essentially in the UK because that's where it, or majority? Uh, certainly not all, but, um, you know, it's far easier given the legislation in the UK than it is in, in other countries. And that's why they, you know, that was my experience. Mm, mm. When I asked senior people, you know, why, why are you doing this? And they said, well, because we can. Right. You know, it was, it was just, well, it's just business. Don't worry, it's not personal, mm. you know. <laughs> but actually... It, it has a big impact. Mm. So that was January. Um, as I say, went through the whole process, saw lots of people leave. You know, I wasn't at risk. Um, obviously, I was considered as one of the 140, yeah, because I sat within that group. Yeah. Um, but it, did, it it left a sour taste in the mouth. And mm. it was, so that then made me, as I said earlier, do the sums. Can mm. I afford to make a change? Mm. And worked out what I would need in mm. order to be able to leave mm. um and then there were just little things and and this mm. will sound really daft but i was sitting in my home office um looking out of the window one day and uh, an ambulance drove past <laughs> and on the ambulance it said driver training <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it was just one of those funny little signs that thought, oh oh <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I could be doing that. Yeah. Um, and my wife, Liz, had, um, ha had said, you know, at some point in the last few years, you know, that she'd seen some if something happening somewhere out in, in public where there was an ambulance crew or whatever. And she thought, oh, Philip could do that, you know. And right. so there were just little, little nudges. And then I, I guess the big nudge was I really have to decide now whether I stay with IBM until I'm 60 or 63 or whatever. Mm and put up with the pressure yeah. or I make the jump, whatever the jump is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, I, I can't pretend that all I've ever wanted to do is be a paramedic. That's not mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. uh, but having found this and then, you know, I started looking for vacancies and found this one at the Southeast coast ambulance service mm -hmm. and applied for it and, you know, went through and, and, and got the position. So uh, it was, you know, finding the vacancy, getting the these little nudges along with the big kick. The mm. big kick was do something different. And the little nudges were, this is what you're going to go and do. Right. Interesting. And it sounds like this is a slow process. This has been a, a considered gradual incremental change. It's happened over years for you rather than, um, you know, two or three events happening in quick succession. And then, you know, like, right, I'm out gone you know quite a quite a sharp uh departure this seems to be quite a, a measured and considered uh exit from ibm and movement into something else absolutely i, I you know and i think it's not that you know i've just had a you know i've just been reamed out by a senior exec who's just mm. torn me into shreds and i've had enough and i'm you know i'm I'm stomping out, see what the, you know, I, right. it was nothing like that. It, yeah. it was much more gentle and considered. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, there were other external influences, people that I talked to who, you know, were beginning to say, well, you know, are you happy with what you're doing? Is that, mm -hmm. um, and again, think with hindsight, one of the really interesting things is I bumped into somebody, hadn't seen him for a couple of years. He didn't know that I wasn't still at IBM and told him just very briefly what I was doing. And he looked at me and he said, that's why you look younger. <laughs> and I thought, wow, you know, somebody hasn't seen me through this whole process, but has can notice that there's a real physical difference in me. Yeah. 
and then that makes me think, well, wow, you know, I'm so pleased that I've made this change in my life. If that's the impact that it's having, because that's got to be good for me. Yes. Versus yeah. the, you know, the ongoing, as I say, high pressure of, of those sorts of jobs. Yeah. And so when you, you handed in your resignation, you are no longer part of IBM. There still seems, it seems like you'd taken a lot of steps to reduce the amount of uncertainty at that point. I think uh, in my mind's eye, it was, you know, you know, quit IBM and then suddenly you're like scrabbling around for different things to do. But it sounds like you very much had your next thing planned, but there still must have been um, ups and downs with that transition. Yeah, I mean, I'm quite a small C conservative sort of person. Um, and, you know, I only handed in my resignation when I had my offer letter from the ambulance service in my hand. Right. Um, and because of the typical inefficiencies of NHS admin, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that was quite hard to get. Um, right. And in fact, I had to ask IBM to be flexible with me because I needed to give less than my full notice in order to get on the first day of the course to to, oh, to learn see. my new job yeah. and they were great about that mm. um but just as as a, as a little side anecdote mm. I, I worked for a very senior exec in the uk uh, in ibm and when i went and gave him my resignation and told him what i was doing he sat back in his chair and he said i cannot tell you how jealous i am and wow. it was fascinating because we talked earlier about what we are all encumbered by and what we all carry mm. and the mm. things that you have to take into consideration. Mm. And, you know, this is somebody who is in his, I don't know, late thirties or something. Um, high flyer will go a very long way in IBM, mm. um, has a huge salary, massive house, four children in private school, you know, so he's got all of that yeah. around him. And, you know, if he looks over the, over the fence mm. um at the alternative it's too big a step it's not you know but what he saw in me was somebody who was saying you know what i'm going to go and do something different and what i want to do rather than just carrying on with yeah. this wow that's that's a fascinating for for your boss to be like i'm so jealous of you yeah. I, that's makes me really wonder what your boss is doing at IBM. And I was thinking, it's not something I had particularly planned on talking about, but it really seems to have come out of this conversation so far. The, you're saying he's got a big house, he's sending his children to, to private school. What's your take on the extent to which material possessions shackle us and restrain us rather than allowing us to live i guess a more enjoyable and and, and enhancing our life because it sounds like you know your your boss and to an extent yourself you know with, with your own house you know these were mm -hmm. things that kept you from doing kept you and your boss from doing things that presumably you would both love doing more than being at ibm it's it's a fascinating um, what's the right word? Bind? It's yeah. a fascinating um, paradox almost. Yes, and, and I guess... Is it a sacrifice worth making? I guess that's my question. And I think it depends where you are at what phase of your life. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, you know, the talking to a colleague, actually my crewmate at now at work mm. um you know he said to me the other day he said you know as i get older he said i now look at cars as something that gets me from a to b mm. versus when i was 20 when i wanted the latest flashiest you know shiniest set of wheels you know because mm. that would you know show everybody that you know i knew what i was doing and i'd got the best you know right so just a, you know, I th I think, you know, we we all make decisions and things that matter change as we go through life. Mm. Um, uh, you know, I it, it it's one of those. It is a very deep question, and 
you know, probably too deep for, for, for this conversation. But oh, it's never too it's, deep. This is where we get no, into no, no, these, no, but... these questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's the point of the podcast. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. But um, I think it depends where you are, doesn't it? And it, it, what phase of life you are. And, you know, how many people are you going to impact by making a decision? And, you know, maybe that's the right thing to do at that mm. time. And everybody says, yep, you're right. We're going to sell the house. We're going to move to whatever, you know. Mm. I made the decision not to do that um, mm. until I'm now in the position where, you know, I can do, I, we haven't had to give much up, if anything, apart from the fact that I'm now driving my dad's 10 year old car instead of the, you know, mm. the, the, the new German car that I had from IBM. Right. Um, so I, I don't think there are any rights and wrongs in this. I think it's mm. where you are at the time and what mm. you decide matters. Mm. Um, and, and there'll be other pressures. You know, there'll be pressures of expectation from family, from friends, from colleagues. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. I've just returned from about 10 days running around the southwest coastline and I had all my possessions... Um, in a in a small backpack uh no tent a bivy bag and a sleeping bag and what i discovered over that 10 days is that it's actually very liberating to be able to exist with very little like the less that if you can be happy and get by with even less stuff and you don't even need you don't need a hotel you don't you don't even need a tent you can just sleep under the stars then <laughs> Um, suddenly you, you it, it's a very freeing sensation and maybe I'm coming across as a hippie but if you don't need all these material possessions to make you fulfilled and happy then it's it kind of takes the pressure off needing to pursue them I suppose and this speaks to perhaps to the the stage of life that I'm at that I um, you know don't have a, a family that wouldn't appreciate living out in, in a bivy bag in the in the open yeah. air <laughs> 365 but, days but, a year but, but but where you make me go thinking about what you've just said is the difference between working at IBM where I was in customer facing sales job, sales management, whatever, mm. where it's all about money. And the, mm. the only real motivation is, can I get more commission? Can I get a bigger pay rise? Right. Um, you know, what's the payback for me? How am mm. I going to beat the competition? Right. Um, and and it's very aggressive, actually. Mm. The a, a lot of the language, a lot of the uh, imagery, uh, whether it's mm. competition in another firm or competition internally, because you're going to do better than Fred next door, who uh, you know, so right. that so that you're higher up the pecking order in for promote. You know, so, right. so there's all of that going on. Mm. Whereas now, you know, the 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 motivation is well, it's it's certainly not about money because. Mm you know, there is absolutely nothing I can do in my job other than progress up the levels and, and get myself more qualified. Mm, mm. Um, uh, you, you know, m money doesn't come into it. it the no. motivation is about making a difference to people. It's about doing the best I can in supporting senior colleagues that I work with every day, you know, yeah. and, and it's a complete mind shift. Mm. So where you are, you say being able to go and bivy on the beach, um, I would hate, <laughs> I'd absolutely hate it. You know, we, we, we did a lot of camping um, when, you know, in, in our, um, when, when the girls were younger and it was never my favorite, um, uh, but, yeah. but they loved it, you know, and certainly, you know, sitting out, eating out, all that sort of stuff I did enjoy. It wasn't yeah. that I hated every minute of it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, uh, and, and, you know, we, we uh, a, a recent holiday with, with Liz, you know, she wanted to go um, with a backpack. So she did. Yeah. I took a big suitcase, you know, because I wanted to, you know, yeah. and, and both were fine. Right. Um, but, mm. you know, I, so I don't see you as a, you know, as a mad hippie at all. I think that you're fortunate in that you have found some time when you're able to go and do what makes your heart sing. Mm. And, you know, we're coming back to, what you said right at the beginning about wh wh where's your heart where where yeah. where is your heart in this and i think if we can make our hearts sing mm. um mm. then 
we're probably on the right path. Yeah. And if our heart is in our boots, you know, because it's, it's squashed and it's not feeling uh, supported and held, then we might probably or might possibly be in the wrong place. Mm. I think it's a lovely expression, like making our hearts sing. And I think that's where if one is motivated by money, I don't think that's ever made someone's heart sing. And to me, perhaps the balance in, in material possessions is, um, I think you need enough to be, um, have your basic needs met and for um, your enjoyment of life, not to be barred because you, you don't have you know, um, a shelter over your head or you know, if you're crammed into a small room. Um, but beyond that, I think, yeah, what makes your heart sing, um, is probably a very good barometer and speaking from experience now, and I wouldn't have always said this, that, um, buying things, I only buy things for a purpose when they, um, I don't know, buying sleeping bags. It means I can sleep under the stars. I, I don't, yeah. um, or my bike. So it means I can go out riding, but not for, not for the sake of buying it. It's, um, i my little rule of thumb is if I'm excited to buy something, it usually means that it's a bad decision because, you know, when you're like excited <laughs> by the whole, oh, I really want this new toy. Like it was when I was what, 14, I bought an Xbox 360 and I was more, it was the process of buying it that I was very excited about. And I wanted to sort of just rush the whole thing through because I didn't want my doubts to get in the way. So my mm. barometer now is like, if it's something I'm not really that excited to buy, um, but I just think I'll, I'll use it. And it still seems like a good idea in a couple of weeks or a month. Um, then it's probably not such a, a passing fad and it's just something I'm going to use and it's the use of it or the way it allows me to live that makes me happy rather than the process of buying it itself well and and it's the motivation isn't it it's it what is the motivation for buying it? is it because it's the latest and mm. come back to your xbox 360 at the age 14 you know yeah. it's the latest coolest gaming platform and you know all your mates will you know want to come around and play it or you know even possibly be jealous because you've got it and they haven't i mean i remember mm. when i was at school um i had some you know sons of very rich Americans, uh, you know, at school with me, who always mm. had the latest skateboard, you know, or, mm. or whatever it was and mm. huge envy. Um, so, yeah. you, you know, is the motivation external or internal? And if it's internal, you know, you're going to buy the best sleeping bag you can get because it's functionally going to give you what you want, which is to mm. sleep out in the stars and not freeze, you know, yes. it, it, it's, yeah. That happened too. <laughs> well, yes, but, but you know, it, th there's nothing external. There's nobody who's going to be. Yeah, uh, you, I mean, there might be one. Oh, or two, look at the extra stripes on that sleeping bag. Absolutely, that carbon fiber yeah. zip. Love it. <laughs> oh, he's got four and a half seasons on that. You know. Yes. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. So, but I think it's about motivation, and it's mm. you know, so you know, if I look around my house now, how much of this stuff that we collect over a lifetime mm. you know do we need mm. and there's an awful lot i'm sure that we could we could discard quite mm. happily um but then you think well why am i then why am i discarding it you know what what purpose am i fulfilling mm. um so i i think motivation and you know what why you do stuff why why you have stuff but i think it's interesting what you say about the, the less excited you get about buying something, the, the more appropriate it is. I think that's a really interesting barometer. Mm. It's, it's worked for me surprisingly well. Um, yeah. Um, moving from the, the unexciting to um, the exciting, and perhaps this is a, a, a totally just an important barometer where the reverse is true. If, 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 um, it's important to be unexcited to buy something. I think it's incredibly important to be excited by what you're doing in life. And mm -hmm. you moved to become an emergency care support worker, which has the catchy acronym you were telling me earlier of ECSW. Um, yeah. Tell us about starting as an emergency care support worker. 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, it's a job title that's meaningless and nobody knows what it means. And I it have does. it written. Well, I have it written in my epaulets on my uniform and, mm. you, you know, I had one person Everyone's stop like, you me. And, yeah, you what is that? Well, no, one actually stopped to, so they could read it, you know, because it's, <laughs> it's anyway. So ECSW is the sort of entry level um, position for somebody working in the frontline emergency ambulance service. So I joined the Southeast Coast Ambulance Service. We provide the ambulance service for Surrey, Sussex and Kent. Um, I was given a four week, four weeks of clinical training, followed by four weeks of driving training. Um, mm -hmm. And then I was out on the road. So, you know, when I started, I didn't really know that much about the job. I didn't know what it entailed. I I assumed it would be about driving, but I didn't know how much medical mm. side of things I would do. Mm. But what I do is I, I always work with somebody more senior than me. Yep. Um, and we share the work. And that's the fascinating thing is that I'll be, I mean, my crewmate is a qualified paramedic. He's been in the service for 10 years. Um, but when we go and see a patient, you know, and let me, you know, in an average shift, 12 hour shift, we'll see six patients. Mm -hmm. So for three of those, I will be the person who in the language, I attend that patient. Mm. So I'll go in, I'll have the conversation. I'll try and work out what's going on. Um, my crewmate will help with taking observations and, and, you know, if necessary, you know, taking an ECG or, or whatever, but it's my job to lead that discussion, work out what we're going to do. And obviously it's, it's, there's a lot of teamwork and we'll perhaps come back to that. Um, mm. cause for me, mm. that's really important. Um, mm. but you know, I'm given that responsibility now yeah. when I get stuck, which I do frequently yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, I've had little, little training and, and not much medical experience. Mm. I've been doing this job now for 16 months. Mm. Um, you know, he will help and, you know, but he'll also push me really hard. Mm -hmm. So there have been in the last few weeks, there've been a couple of occasions where I said, well, what do you think? He said, your patient. <laughs> you know? Now I know I that do? he's not, yeah, I know that he's not going to let me do anything that would, would cause mm -hmm. any harm or, or whatever, but he's, he's pushing me to say, well, you know, you've, you've, you've been out with me for a good while now, you know how I think. So what mm. do you think is going on? Mm. And the flip side being that when you go to somebody who's really sick mm. and needs the experience and the skill in a hurry, he will just say, I'm dealing with this, you know? Yeah, so right. Philip, I want you to do this, 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 and this. And my skill is being able to do all of those things and help him mm -hmm. and, and get that done in a quick and efficient manner. Yeah. So the ECSW role, it's an entry role. Mm. It positions me then to get on courses to, to move up the ladder, which is, is where I'm now going. Yeah. Um, but it's also somebody that does provide that support, um, you, you know, for, for, for more senior people. It's, um, it sounds like a role I would almost be surprised you find rewarding. And this speaks more about me. Like there's a lot of driving involved to me. That would be really, um, Oh, I, I don't like spending lots of time behind the wheel, uh, particularly not late at night. So what is it that for you makes this rewarding? And particularly compared Think, to what you were doing before, because that was part of a team as well with IBM, presumably there was, was only with other people. So what was it that made this well, so different? I'm, I'm glad that you've come back to that, Luke, because my experience in the corporate world, um, hang on a second, I just need to cough. My experience in the, in the corporate world is that there's an awful lot of talk about teamwork. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the sales side of things, um, actually quite rare, quite, it was quite rarely demonstrated. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's very difficult when, when you have a bunch of people who are all on commission and all mm. fighting for an amount of a commission pot. Mm you know, they're, they're, they're enemies almost. Yes. They all work in the same office. You talk about, Oh, we belong to this team. Yeah. But my, uh, maybe my narrow perspective was that I, I never really saw real teamwork. I know it existed, had to in, in other parts of the company perhaps. Hmm. Whereas now, 
Um, the job I do, as I say, there's always two of us in an ambulance. It's always me and a senior. Um, you can only do the job if you work as a team. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, uh, one of my favorite examples of, of teamwork um, in the current job was I had a, went to see a patient, a chap in his mid seventies, who was reasonably wobbly on his feet. So he had a stair lift, you know, okay. one of these that has a rail up the stairs and yep. a seat that goes down the track. Well, to cut a long story short, he'd fallen from the top of the stairs, head first down the stairs. He'd landed on the first landing of the stairs and wedged his head under the rail of the stair lift. Ooh. Okay. Um, now, that's not something that you and a crewmate can deal with. You know, he mm. was absolutely wedged stuck. So I made a radio call and I asked for help. Four fire crews turned up. So I had four fire engines outside this house. Okay. Um, and you know they unscrewed the unscrewed the stair lift and physically lifted the whole thing up mm. so that we could then get this chap out and deal with him now chap himself was absolutely fine remarkably after all of that and we left him at home you know with a cup of tea <laughs> <laughs> but the teamwork mm. of two different services coming together with a mm. sole aim and the sole aim was to make a difference to that individual mm. um and you know it, 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 to to if he'd been there for a long time, that would have been very detrimental to him, mm. to his health. But by working as a team, you know, lots of, lots of discussion to and throwing, what can we do? You know, at one point mm. they wanted to saw the thing in half, but I said, not sure I want a, a big blade next to his head, you know, okay, well, we'll unscrew it then. You know, so, <laughs> that also but, worked. <laughs> yeah. So it's, and, and day to day, you know, working with a crewmate and standing at the top of stairs, scratching your head, thinking how on, earth are we going to get this lady out you know down this little tiny staircase that we're going to have to carry her down you know but right. it's it's to and fro and mm. despite the fact that i'm the most junior and you know with the least experience my views and opinions are sought and listened to mm. as part of the ongoing you know if it's a medical thing where it's well i know what this means i know medically what i've got to do then i'm not even going to you know it's not up to me i don't mm. have the knowledge but when it's something like, how do we get somebody out? What's the best route in? Are we going to use the carry chair or the truck? You know, all these things that we mm. work through. Problem very, solving. Very much done as a team. Yes, it is. Yeah, in a very physical, spatial yeah. way. But it, it, it's, you know, one of the things that surprised me actually was, because I thought I'd come in as the most junior and just be told what to do. And then right. to find somebody with 10 years experience, say, well, what do, what do you think? What are we going to do now? <laughs> Whoa. Yeah. You know, you're asking me. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm quite interested that you're saying you you went in as the most junior, and this is coming from a background where you were pretty senior at IBM. How difficult was it to adjust to this uh, difference in status, if you would use that term? Was that perceived by others? Was that perceived by you? It must have been quite a big change, though. So it's a massive change, um, you know, to go back to the beginning. That, that, was, that was really interesting. I think mm. there are quite a lot of things that were different. Um, mm. I think, um, I, I mean, just the types of people that I now work with mm. is, is incredibly broad. Um, you know, I've gone from working in an environment where probably everybody you know, with one or two exceptions, everybody was a graduate mm. um, at IBM. Mm. Um, uh, you know, all, you know, with aspirations that in many ways were based around money and, and possessions and the big house and the car, all those things we've talked about. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, the, so this made me chuckle. When I went for my interviews for this job, they mm. said, uh, bring, bring your, um, your certificates along. Yeah. So I took my certificates, you know, my O levels, my A levels, my degree, my, you know, one or two things I've got out there you know, after, after degree. Yeah. Um, and, and they dutifully photocopied them all and sent them off to HR. And then when I looked at my HR record after I joined and got my job qualifications, math GCSE, <laughs> because, <laughs> because that was the requirement of the job. Right. That is the only thing that you had to have to get this job was, mm. was maths. Um, 
so necessarily it's a you know they're a very different mix of people a mm. paramedic is a, is a degree qualification and mm. that's what i aspire to and hopefully mm. we'll get there in the next mm. within the next five years mm. but there are people that i would otherwise not really have come across and certainly not worked with and that's been fascinating you know people with very broad experience of of you know different different aspects of life um has certainly broadened my perspective um you know on and in, in ways that i couldn't have couldn't have imagined um yeah you, you know just it it sounds so, like a even so it sounds like a difficult transition uh, well actually what what is striking me right now is almost how um easily you you made that transition uh to cite a, a small example from my own life it's not a direct sort of parallel but i remember 17 years old you know this fit young runner cyclist went to my first swimming session in 10 years and i was like you know it, it, to make the uh, the analogy you know i had all the qualifications i probably had a great you know um you know fitness and vo2 max and you know probably the fittest person in the pool i got in and i didn't know a thing i didn't know how to even move my arms i was useless yeah um and well that was certainly quite a humbling experience it seems like you've taken this very much in your stride and i'm just interested in was there a lot of thinking mental preparation before you started that okay well this is just gonna be a t completely different ball game i'm now just gonna be phil or philip i know you don't like phil you know but just <laughs> um you know one no one knows or cares about the fact that i've once you know had a high-flying job because that's just totally irrelevant it was was that did you have to go through that process or was it a rude I awakening guess, i don't know about rude awakening i mean certainly had to go through some of the process and and before i even applied i i went and had a beer with a friend of my daughter's who's a paramedic with london ambulance service mm -hmm. to pick his brain about what the job was about and mm. one of the questions i asked him was i said you know i know that they cannot legally discriminate on age but do they really want somebody you know my age i think i was 52 when i applied um surely they want you know kids out of school that they're going to get 30 40 years service out of and he said absolutely not he said yes of course they want young people but they also want people with life experience mm. and you know the way that i've seen that manifest itself was there was a chap on my training course who was painfully shy you know was intellectually was there he he, he got the 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 clinical stuff but what yep. he couldn't deal with was working with a patient he didn't know where to begin. He couldn't mm. have the conversation. Um, right. Whereas just starting the number, with the hello and how are you well, doing? Well, just... Yeah, but but just almost tongue tied by right. that. And you know the number of times that I've sat in the back of an ambulance on the way to hospital, holding the hand of a ninety three year old lady who's scared out of her wits because mm. she's going to hospital. Mm. Um, you know, this chap I'm thinking of would probably thought, oh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to touch her you know yeah whereas this was just an old lady you needed a bit of reassurance so mm. there's a bit of life experience that, that came into it mm. i think i i think a lot of people couldn't understand why i'd given up a high paid job mm. um you know sitting behind a desk for something where you're out in the community often getting wet mm. um, sometimes getting shouted at you know going into very very different environments you know we we go into some pretty horrible places from time to time yeah. um and you know i've had to learn how to deal with that mm. so i think in terms of preparation i didn't really know what i was getting into um i took it you know i studied hard during the clinical course um mm. because i wanted to do as well as i could and i wanted to learn as much as i could yeah um and i keep that going i i try to you know, constant conversations about, well, what, why did you do that? Why didn't we do this? Did you think mm. of that? Um, and, you know, my crewmate now, now that I've got on, I'm on the course now starting in September to get to the next level um, within the service. Mm. So he now, he starts drilling me. We, you know, we'll finish a patient. He said, right, what did you think of that? And I'll say, well, I think we did. And he said, yeah, but why didn't you do that? Well, because, you know, and then you mm -hmm. have, so mm -hmm. it's, constant learning constant reflection constant um mm. encouragement also yeah 
and that suggests to me you know that there's definitely a maturity and mindset there that you yeah, you don't necessarily have to be you know mid career to have that but it certainly say yeah. something if i was 20 and i joined i probably would have wanted to do the least amount of work possible to get by and get through so i think that's that's interesting itself the the approach that you you bring um so you're saying the teamwork is a very rewarding aspect of it. What else gives you that life satisfaction from this very different career? I think um, probably two things. I think the first one is that I make a difference every day. Mm. I make a difference sometimes in a very big way when you save somebody's life. More often in a very small way where you know, you go to the old lady who's fallen over and can't get up. Um, and more often than not, you get them up, check them over, leave mm. them in an armchair. But sometimes mm. they've broken their hip or their leg or their arm or something and you have to deal with it. But you make a difference. Um, if you weren't there, you, you know, they, 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 wouldn't, they, they wouldn't be in a good place. So there's the satisfaction of making a real difference to individuals. Now, compare that to IBM. Um, IBM does a, a huge amount of good in the world, um, but it's very invisible. Hmm. You know, if, if IBM, you know, has some wonderful software that can help with, you know, artificial intelligence that helps with understanding cancer, yeah. And you, know, you and I have talked about that in the past, about some of some of the software that, that they have that makes medical journal papers available to every doctor by, you know, almost type in the symptoms and get back a list of, well, these are the journals you need to read type yes. answers. Yeah. You know, you can see how that can be really powerful mm. and really helpful, but mm. actually quite invisible. And for me, somehow, because m- most of what I was doing was working with banks, making them more efficient, you know, so, so that was actually, I don't think I want to do this anymore, right. you know. So w- whereas now it, it's, you know, if I can make a difference to three or four or five or six people in mm. a shift, then that's real tangible, you know, I've done something here. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that I think teamwork is part of it, but actually family, it's a real family. And it's described by many people as a family. Mm. And that was demonstrated so eloquently with my friend Pete, because he died from COVID um, in the hospital that he worked in. Mm. And on the day of his funeral, hundreds of colleagues from the ambulance service went to the ambulance station, lined the road in the pouring rain, and the funeral cortege with police escort, with fire service turned up, you know, because wow. he was hugely loved and, and known. But th- it was just an outpouring of love, mm. you know, and I think everybody there would, would describe it that way you know, we are a big green family. And, you, you know, I think that the police would say they're a, you know, they're a blue family and the fire, you know, it, mm. we, it, it's, it's, it's something bigger that you belong to yeah. that when you work for a corporation, you would never describe it that way. Mm. You know, or, or if somebody does describe it that way, you think, yeah, yeah, you've just read a book about, you know. <laughs> yeah. So how to build teamwork you know, that, and culture. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, when, when you see a patient and it's a difficult situation and, you know, you can imagine some of the things that, that we have to deal with day to day, there's incredible support there from mm. colleagues, from management from, and all sorts from just, just to help. It really is a family. And, and yeah. you know, when you get stuck, you turn to the family and, mm-hmm. you, you know, there is never... I've never had anybody who's, oh, just pull your socks up, get on with it. You know, it's so, yeah, let's have a coffee. Let's talk about it, you know. Right. So it seems like there's a, there's two things here. One, that very um, direct, um, you can see the causality of your actions. Your actions can lead to a direct change in someone else's life that is in front of your eyes and you can see and you can know that you've made a difference rather than being an incremental um 
you've been pushing for an incremental change in the cogs of global commerce and finance. And it also sounds like the Because the goals are very different, it sounds like, to a lot of the corporate world, your everyone's attitude is, is, is less competitive and you're, it might be a, a cliche to say you're working towards, you know, a more idealistic goal, you know, helping other people in, in a very, um, it is in a hands-on way and I think that probably does make a difference and it changes the incentive structure, which I wonder to the extent that builds this family environment because... I guess, you know, family relations in, in our own families, they're not built around trying to make money. They're trying to you know, mm. bring out the best in each person. And I suppose that sounds like the kind of culture that you're now part of. And I think it's the difference between being part of a service mm. versus being part of a corporation. Mm. Isn't that an interesting um, word to use? A service. Yeah. A service to help yeah. other people. And, and, you know, if you, but if you look at, the organization I work for is the Southeast Coast Ambulance Service. Mm. You know, our colleagues opposite are the, are the fire service, mm. fire and rescue service. Mm. And, you know, it's something that I'd never experienced before. Yeah. Um, you know, when, uh, you know, I, my, my parents are both teachers. I was brought up around education. Um, you know, that's a different environment. Um, the corporate world is, is itself, you know, and so that's one of the biggest surprises and, and, you know, biggest changes for me was uh, almost a feel of belonging more. Mm. You, you know, people will often say, oh, I'm proud to be an IBMer. You know, an IBMer was the phrase used for somebody working for the company, you yeah. know, and in some ways I was, mm. but actually in a lot of ways I wasn't. And whereas now, you know, am I proud to belong to the ambulance service? Yes, I am. Mm. You've, mentioned pete and him passing away from covid <laughs> and that really is a very powerful and clear indication of the unusual in some senses responsibilities and risks that you take on as as part of um, being in the, the medical profession and I, other doctors and, and nurses, uh, everyone involved, you know, particularly at this time of COVID, um, are at increased risk. And I was wondering if you could give us a flavor of what it has been like for you uh, being very much on the front line. You're visiting people's homes with suspected COVID symptoms. You have have an insight into what... For me, living in Bristol, I've not really experienced at all. I've kind of been very lucky to live in, you know, in my house. I go running on the, the downs and the park nearby. Of course, I haven't been going out to cafes and stuff. I feel I've been very isolated. I haven't visited a hospital, thank goodness. Um, so um, what's this time been like for you? It's been... Um... It's been fascinating. It's been fascinating in many ways in, in how society deals with something that turns it upside down. Um, mm -hmm. It's been a time of almost constant change. Um, so, you know, the, there's been a lot of discussion that you, know, you see in the press about uh, personal protective equipment or PPE mm -hmm. being available. Um, so I think I've now been formally fit tested for five different masks you know so the the surgical masks the normal you know elastic ear yeah. ones that's what we, we wear those into every patient now mm, mm. but you know it was only three months ago when you know oh, well don't wear one of those and, unless you think they might have something because you, you know well we, we don't want to waste them whereas right and, but, th Very but then the masks huge and it changes every week you know but yeah. the the masks i've been fit so if we go in where you think uh, it's what they call an aerosol generating procedure so if you're working with a patient who might breathe droplets out for whatever reason mm. um and you, you know you have to have a mask where nothing gets through and you only know that if you've gone through a 
process of being fit tested for it. Mm -hmm. The trouble is that you get fit tested for one and then the service runs out of those and can't get any more. So they get a different type. So you have to go. So it's this ongoing process of making sure that we have what we need um, Mm. to be safe. And, Mm. you know, the, the cleaning process that every single piece of equipment you use with every patient is now completely cleaned before you Mm. go on to the next one. Um, You know, whereas a year ago, you know, if I took your temperature, Mm. we we use these thermometers that go in the ear, Mm. that the end bit is plastic gets discarded. So a year ago, that's fine. Just put it back in his box, use that with the next patient. Absolutely Mm. no worries with that. Whereas now the entire Mm. thing is cleaned. Right. so a change in process. And, mm. But I think more importantly, I think there's been a change in attitude um, among patients and the number of patients I've been to in the last three or four months who really, really need to be in hospital, um, nothing to do with COVID, mm. but will not go. And the, the, the fear mm. of going to hospital and actually uninformed because the way the hospitals are working and yes, they, you know, they've had to go through immense change and, and, you know, the number of times I've been into our local hospitals, okay, so where's A and E today? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Because, well, because they, what they, in the early days, they made the biggest part of A and E COVID only. And Ah. if you were non COVID and showing no symptoms, you went to a little side room and then Mm. uh, a month ago, they switched it around. So yeah. they now have two COVID beds because they're not seeing anybody mm. um, and 12 beds for everybody else. Mm. But, but going to people who we'd say, look, you really need to go to hospital. Well, mm. I'm, not, I'm not going, I'm, I'm too frightened, you know, and we'd sit and have a discussion. And sometimes we could explain that they would be as safe as they possibly could be if yeah. we took them into that area. But, but that's been really interesting. And, you know, at the height of COVID, you know, when, when we were up at the, you know, the, the peaks, yeah. actually the ambulance service was relatively quiet. Um, How come? You know, well, because a lot of people, I think lots of reasons, um, people, the pubs were shut. So people weren't out fighting. Okay. Um, people weren't driving anywhere. So there were fewer accidents. People weren't doing that much you know, they weren't playing sports, you know, so all of those sorts of things. Mm. Um, I think people were not calling us who should have been. And it was probably halfway through lockdown that the government started saying to people, actually, if you need help, you need to call for it. You know, um, you know, we're we're all still here. And, you know, Don't don't hide, don't, think oh well i'll just wait um you know i'm reading more and more in the press now about people you know the, the, who, who who are going to be more ill because they haven't sought help mm. um during covid than than they should be mm. um so it, it as i say it, it's it's more been a process of managing and coping with change and mm. constant change mm. about well this is what we do in this situation this is the equipment we use this is how we do it um you know, which I think has been really interesting having to stay on top of all of that. Um, uh, you know, and then, you know, just having to cope with the practicalities of it. You know, if you go to somebody who's had cardiac arrest and you're delivering CPR in a full body suit, um, with a (laughs) mask on and goggles and multiple pairs of gloves, CPR with a mask on, that sounds difficult. Yeah. Well, so we're wearing the mask. Um, You know, and, it, and you're working on the chest. Um, How do you do the mouth to mouth bit? You know, no, mouth to mouth is doesn't exist. We we never do mouth to mouth. Now, or, uh, sorry, this is now just a technical question. But <laughs> I'm interested. I because CPR, you blown someone's. No, so they? CPR is chest no. compressions. Oh, it's just chest um, compression, right? Uh, with um, with, with a, a defibrillator to to shock the heart if it needs it. Right. Uh, the the ventilation and the provision of you know the management of the airway is is mm. done with we've got various devices that do that um but but no mouth to mouth i mean that's what i was taught when i did my first aid at school however long ago that was right. um but no that that's that's not part of we, we never do that oh okay you've got other things to do the mouth bit <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah yeah absolutely okay. yeah um mm. but but you know just just coping with that um and you know it's incredibly uncomfortable 
And mm-hmm. if you've got, you know, that sort of situation, the last one I did, there were six of us in a tiny little flat, all, all working hard, and we were utterly drained at the end of it, you know, right. just physically, physically drained. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, as I say, it's, it's been really interesting how the cycles have gone. And, mm. you know, we're pretty much back to normal, normal levels of work now. Um, I'm seeing very, very few people with respiratory problems. Um, mm-hmm. uh, very few with, with COVID symptoms, mm-hmm. um, and much more back to the, back to the things that we were seeing before, you know? Yeah. Did you feel like you were worried not only for your own health, but you know, you're, you're living with Liz, your, your wife, one of your daughters is at home. Mm. Was that um, was that a difficult thing to have that responsibility? And thinking, well, I'm putting myself at a high risk. This could also um, impact people that I love. Yeah. So it's something that we've talked about. Um, it's something where uh, I've changed the way I work, um, the actual pattern of work. Mm. So you know, when I get home from work now, I come in through the back door, not the front. Mm, okay. I strip off, everything goes into a bag. Um, and I go straight in the shower, you know, w- which didn't used to happen. Uh, you know, it, it would, if I, if I'd had, you know, if I, if I'd worked with a patient, which had been messy or dirty or whatever, then yes, I would. But you know, that, that never happened before. Whereas now it's every single shift, everything comes off. Um, we've been very careful about, hand washing and about not visiting elderly parents and things you know over this period because you know i have to be at higher risk than many other people because Mm. i've worked all the way through it you know i'm i'm very interested that having had an antibody test a week ago to find that i i'm negative i've not had covid Mm -hmm. um so i'm obviously doing something right because i've very definitely had patients with it and been exposed to it and i'm in hospital every day so Mm -hmm. you you know the it's been there but the the processes and the practices that we follow um are effective and i think you know one of the question moving um away from covid now but onto the nature of your job that i'm sort of intrigued about is how do you cope with the night shift particularly when you're driving around you know for me when I get to 11 o'clock at night that is definitely you know my head should hit the pillow and certainly nothing useful gets done after like 10 30. Um, so on a practical note how do you actually get through the night shifts? Um, it's interesting because that was probably the thing I was most worried about mm-hmm. when I moved when I changed jobs. Um, I'd never worked shifts um, the the prospect of 12 hour shifts as well you know that that's a long time to be at work yeah um and it's only when you actually get there and you see how it works and you realize that you actually you know quotes only see six patients in a shift you know i think i think the busiest shift i've ever done i saw 10 patients um and the the i I think the other end of the scale i think i saw two you know Mm. um so, so the practicality of it is different from the idea. And I guess also I'd come from a job where I was in front of a computer all day, every day in an office, mm. um, not even with free coffee. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, you can't do that for 12 hours at a stretch. Whereas this is so varied, you know, some of it, yes, you're driving, um, yeah. You, you know, uh, so getting two patients, but then you can spend an hour in a patient's house trying to work out what's going on, what the best, you know, sometimes we'll give treatment mm. in the house and then see, well, has that made a difference? Yeah, okay. So now let's think about what we're going to do or, you know, to the previous example, what help do I need to get this person out from under the stair rail, you know? Yeah. Um, and then you may take them to hospital and then there's the process of handing over in hospital. So it, it's a job where you've got different things going on at different points. So, mm you're not sitting in front of a screen. There's much more movements, much more active. There's occasional lifting. There's, mm. you know, lots of equipment to, to move about and, yeah. and, you know, understand and sort out and, and work on. So that's one piece of it. Mm. But, but it make for it nights, less sedentary than your IBM yes. work? Oh, oh absolutely. 
Okay. Absolutely. They were, I was thinking yeah. sitting down in an ambulance, but no, you're moving around more than you would when you're at your desk. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously there is time sitting down when, when you're driving, mm -hmm. but then, you know, when you get to the patient and, you know, they're upstairs and you're up and down and up and down getting different bits of kit or, or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and as I say, sometimes we have to carry people downstairs or, you know, mm. I never do that at IBM, <laughs> funnily enough. Um, so, so yes, there's a, is, is a wide variety. And night shifts was, was the other thing that really worried me because mm. I traveled a lot with IBM. I, I went to the US a lot. Um, and I knew that when I flew to the US, I would always try and stay up till nine-ish local time before I went to bed. And I knew that around eight o'clock I'd hit a wall you know, mm. sort of one, two o'clock in the morning, UK time. Mm. Um, and I thought, well, that's, that's what night shifts are going to be like. And surprisingly to me, it's not. I, I've managed to find a routine um, where I, you know, get a couple of hours sleep in the afternoon before my first night shift. That gets me through. Um, and then, you know, I sleep for seven hours when I get home from seven o'clock or something to two in the afternoon. And it, I just manage it. I I'm, I don't really know how or why, but right. I don't get to, as you say, you know, eleven o'clock and think, right, I need to sleep now. Um, and I think partly it was when I when I first started. I think there was so much adrenaline of right. you know just trying to cope with the job and do everything I needed to without tripping over my own feet. <laughs> um, that now I'm a year and a half in, I'm, you know, I, I know what's coming and how to deal with it, but I've got, I've got the pattern in place, yeah, which seems to work. And is there something that you do to unwind um, from, from these shifts? Well, uh, I try to cycle as much as I can. Um, mm -hmm. I do cycle to and from work. And I, I mean, that's not very far, but it's 10 minutes uphill to get home. Okay. Um, and Liz has noticed that uh, a, a difference when I cycle compared to when I drive. Mm. Um, that actually just having that, as you well know, uh, just a little bit of exercise can make yeah. a huge difference. Absolutely. I think uh, I've said it before, but anyone who knows me and knows, you know, they know when I haven't done any exercise because I'm this grumpy old guy. Um, <laughs> makes, you know, so it totally changes my character. I'll come quite clean. Um, don't don't come near me if I haven't been for a run. Um, mm. Philip, it's been fascinating talking to you about the the ins and outs of your, your time at IBM, moving to the ambient service, the big transition that that was. Was there a piece of advice that you were given, or a piece of advice that was that you'd like to give? that you feel is very important for anyone who's considering you know really quite a large change in their career or into a jump into the unknown of some sort i think we've touched on it through this discussion i think it's find what makes your heart sing um mm. i didn't know i was going to find that um i uh, it was interesting. I was actually talking to a psychotherapist friend about what I'm now doing and had a, a similar conversation to this. And she said, you know, you're so lucky that you found this. Yeah, she didn't yeah. use the phrase that makes your heart sing. And, but it does. And I think when I started it, I didn't know it would. It was, right. was a leap into the unknown. It was something that I had a suspicion was going to be more me than than you know the corporate job um i i do have some regrets that i didn't do it earlier uh, but mm. you know i i just need to move on from that um yeah. i yeah. this is a job you know like any any role of any part of life there are bits that don't work so well or bits that are frustrating or boring or tedious but at the end of the day i'm doing something that makes a difference and you know it, it's the right place for me to be thank you philip mm. to finish um this is my own little personal bit of uh, self-improvement and i'm ask each of my guests three questions so i can basically leech ideas um off the people i talk to <laughs> Uh, and uh, you are no different. Um, 
I'm firstly, you know, always interested in sort of where where has been meaningful or interesting in places that I might want to visit or other people listening might want to visit. So where has a place been that either you've enjoyed or has been a very significant or special place to you? I think um, there, there are two places that, that spring to mind when you ask that question. The first one is Box Hill, mm-hmm. um, which in is a loc- in Surrey, local beauty spot. Um, it's my normal cycle route. I, mm-hmm. I have a 20 mile route that I, I go on and I cycle up Box Hill and it was part of the Olympic road race route. So, you know, it, it's very well known. And on a, at a weekend, there are uh, hundreds of cyclists um, yes. going up yeah. and down. Um, so I love going up there. It's a lovely view um, and it's a nice ride. Um, the other place is the Albert Hall. Mm-hmm. Um, because I've played there many times um, with one of my orchestras and it is the most fabulous building to play in. Um, And we did a a, a concert for children, uh, Mm -hmm. school kids, Um, 4,000 of them from London schools, never been to a concert, even vaguely classical before and had Mm -hmm. no idea how to behave. And we walked out to a wall of screaming (laughs) and it didn't stop for two hours of the concert. It was just the most astonishing experience of unbridled response to what we were doing that you don't get when you, when you're playing to adults, you know, how fantastic. Um, So yeah. So very, very different places, you know, one outdoors, beautiful and another one, just, uh, uh, such a huge body experience that, that, you know, I, I, I will always remember that feeling of walking out onto that stage. That's incredible. Um, and on the topic of music, what has been a favourite, the favourite piece of yours or one that is very special to you? So uh, actually from the Albert Hall, um, mm-hmm. from a very early visit to the proms when mm-hmm. I was uh, probably something like 15, mm-hmm. um, Bruckner's Third Symphony. Um, mm-hmm. Bruckner is not very well known generally. Um, he influenced Mahler. Uh Um, but what he does with harmonies, um, particularly in the brass just goes right through you. It is astonishing. Um, and so, you you know, I, I mean, I love many different types of music, different genres. Um, but it's Bruckner three is, is for me. Wow. Thank you. I'm going to listen to that now and I'll put a (laughs) link to that in the description for the podcast as well. So anyone who's interested can hear the harmonies rippling through the brass. My final question, Philip, uh, your favorite book. So again, I'm going to give you two um, because I'm being greedy. I'm really pushing the boat out here. I know, I know, pushing the the boundaries. So so there are two. One, and, and I think this plays to a lot of what we've talked about. It's called Feel the Fear and Do It mm-hmm. Anyway by Susan Jeffries, mm-hmm. um, which is all about what we've talked about. It's mm-hmm. about, um, y- you know, whatever point you are at in life and whatever decision you're trying to make, um, don't be put off by the fear. Uh, I talked mm-hmm. earlier about being, you know, 15 years ago, it was too frightening to think about leaving IBM mm-hmm. and stepping out into something that didn't have this you know, big pay packet. Mm -hmm. Um, I think now with what I know now, what I feel now, where I am now, I would do it differently, but that's Mm -hmm. hindsight. Um, but that's a very helpful book. I've, I've recommended it to a lot of people and they found it useful. Mm. So strongly, strongly recommend that one. And the second one is a a little known book, but one I came across during a a course at IBM and it's called leadership and self-deception. It's called getting out of the box. Um, and it's about, you know, we're all in our own little box, our own little worlds, our own um, perspectives on life. And it's very easy to stay inside your own box and mm. not understand what other people's boxes are or how you influence others or how you come across to others. Right. Um, and one of the reasons I, and it's, a, it's, a, it's just a little tiny book, mm-hmm. um, but it's really interesting that Liz knows when I've read it. <laughs> You know, because if I go back to it and read it, she sees a difference in me wow. um, of, of how I've, you know, just adjusted something a little bit. So 
yeah so two books <laughs> and i i'm i'm totally intrigued by that book and i i'm gonna go on amazon and get it but um <laughs> um what can you just quickly tell us how you um i don't know is it be a bit more self-aware or understand more about what other people think about you or how your actions are coming across what is there is it, what is there a, a technique that you found has worked best of all for you um, I'm, I, I, I don't think a particular technique. I think it's just trying to bring kindness and compassion into everything I do. And that, that you know, it's a little bit cliche, but it's, it is what I try to do, um, you know, particularly at work. Um, I try to see the person um, in the patient. Um, you know, they might be in the most filthy flat with, clutter everywhere but they're still a human needing help um and just try to be you know, say kind and compassionate and and you know to bring everything i possibly can to help that individual and then the same with its friends or its strangers on the tube you know um try to be kind because you never know what people are going through yeah. um and that's something that i do try and not always succeed, but it's uh, it is a, it is a goal. I think that's a fantastic note to end this podcast on, Philip. Um, it's been a real, real pleasure to chat with you. I think I will see not only the corporate world differently, um, but also the service. Um, the ambulance service and the fire service um, and the other services in, mm. in our society. Thank you for sharing your time and thoughts with me and everyone here on the Facing Up podcast. Oh, thank you, Luke. It's been a great pleasure talking to you.